hot. It's hot as hell. Um, if I could, I would be here naked, but I, you know, alas. Please excuse the momentary gum chewing. It's because I have sinus pressure build up in my ear and I can only hear myself if I'm chewing gum. <laughs> ASMR, you're at the financial aid office. Everyone's poor here, hon. <laughs> But yeah, um, hello, hi, it's Kendall here. If you're new around here, welcome. If you're not new around here, what is up, I'm Skillet Biscuit. And happy Saturday. If you don't know what Saturday is, Saturday is when I do a little something on my channel called Bad Movies in a Beat, the series on my channel where I talk about bad movies whilst putting my makeup on. So last week we were here and I did an impromptu viewing of Butt boy, quality content. <laughs> it's the story of a man who acquires the power of, of like a, like a tornado level suction through his butthole uh, and he uses it um, for evil. And it's the story of how he's caught. I don't want to spoil it too much, but he commits various crimes, including but not limited to kidnapping. I don't want to spoil it for you. You can figure it out. If you want to check that out, by the way, you can check it out up above or you can check it out in the Bad Movies in a Beat playlist. This week, it is the long awaited return and the finale finally of my exploration, my first impressions of the Fifty Shades of Grey series. I didn't even know they made a third movie, but apparently they did. For those of you that are new to the series, I've already talked about the first two Fifty Shades of Grey movies, Fifty Shades of Grey and Fifty Shades Darker. And this week we'll be finally finishing it off by looking at Fifty Shades Freed. Now, admittedly, it seems like only yesterday I was looking at the last Fifty Shades of Grey movie, but alas, it's already been like six months. <laughs> it's crazy how fast time flies when the movies aren't very good. Because even in that time span, I have forgotten virtually everything that has happened in this series. The only thing I remember is like, oh yeah, bland white couple having sex and it's bad acting and the music is decent. For those of you that are unfamiliar with the Fifty Shades of Grey series, or aren't quite aware of the history of Fifty Shades of Grey and its humble beginnings. Fifty Shades of Grey actually started off as a sexed up Twilight fan fiction that was later turned into an incredibly, incredibly popular, horribly written New York Times best-selling novel trio, which was later adapted, of course, into films. Hard to say whether or not these films are better or worse. As standalone media, as standalone content, they are truly, awful, but not just because of like bad acting, questionable morality, which though of course is, is very present in most romance, but especially, you know, this one that's so focused on the Dom McDomerson. There's also BDSM for those of you that don't know. Um, that's how it got edgified from Twilight. But the thing that I find most egregious perhaps about this film in comparison to the other ones is that this one can't even rely on like a good soundtrack. But as far as like standalone media, these movies are bad, but in a way that I find almost remarkably forgettable. <laughs> as I've said before, I've already done two videos on Fifty Shades of Grey and I can't tell you anything about those movies <laughs> if you ask me. And it's not like I'm gonna want to sit there and watch those movies over again to remember where the storyline is going. So what did I do? I did what I did last time. I went back to my video. Not to toot my own horn, beep, beep, choo, choo. I am much more entertaining <laughs> than the film. Still funny, still hilarious, still some of my best work personally, if I had to say. To give myself a bit of a recap on the happenings of the Christian Grey, Anastasia, Anastasia Steele love, quote unquote, story. And as I watched the third movie, I watched it with this beautiful air of relief, understanding that again, this is the last movie, thank God. Um, but two, this movie is only an hour and a half where the other two were very funny and thought that they could push this non-story for two hours. If we don't include credits, this movie is an hour and a half. Very doable, okay? Especially because we're closing stuff up. Don't drag this out for two hours. Don't add more sex scenes just to drag it out. Granted, there's plenty. So I appreciated greatly that this movie just decided to rip the Band-Aid off. And in similar fashion, let's get started on the movie itself. This is Fifty Shades Freed. As movies in a series usually do, this movie kicks off from the end of the last movie. Christian Grey, traumatized billionaire bad boy with a dumb kink, and Anastasia Steele, mousy good girl, are soon to be wed. Gotta say though, the dress is a banger. So, little victories. She also has a costume change into an equally fire pantsuit. I've never seen someone leave their wedding in a pantsuit, but I'm with it. 
It's cute. I love a pantsuit. But soon into this movie, I realized that it's definitely gonna go against the grain. Usually one of the things I've always said is that bad movies tend to have the best music. This one fails on all fronts, baby. <laughs> almost impressively bad, which is sad considering we're coming off of love me like you do, la la love me like you do. And that other one, I don't wanna live forever. And I am running me. I just wanna keep calling your name. Now, being that I understand what I'm getting when I watch a Fifty Shades of Grey movie, I know that doesn't mean like the quality of the movie itself is going to get any better, but I do find it very annoying. Like how hard is it to have good taste in music? It's really not hard. But they're on their honeymoon. Oh, butterscotch. Got it on my shirt. But they're on their honeymoon. They're going to operas, traveling, you know, doing all that stuff that rich married people do. And just because they're married doesn't mean that, you know, Christian is any more of a secure man. He's still equally as insecure and possessive as he's always been. Actually, now he feels like he has more legitimacy to do so because she is his wife after all now. They go to a topless beach. And for some reason, Christian is like cover up, even though everyone there is topless. You know, the titties are open and free, which is kind of the point of going to that beach. Like, how are we gonna come to a topless beach and then you're like, don't swing your tatas to Timbuktu. I've been naked in semi-public twice in my life. Both were in Korean Jim Bongs. And you know, you think it'd be weird and then you realize you're just naked. You know, you still look at people in the face. Like if people looking you up and down and stuff is very weird. But like for the most part, you forget people are naked. You're just, you're just vibing. Kinda nice actually, just sitting there, tit swinging, steeped in each other's soup, which is kind of gross when you think about it, but don't think about it. It's kind of nice. <laughs> anyway, but anyway, Christian is nervous that her tatas will be all over the front page of the Enquirer or something, because again, now she is the wife of a billionaire after all. And the tabloids would just love to see the titties of Christian Grey's new wife. But while they're away enjoying their time on their honeymoon, Christian Grey's office is broken into by a man disguised as the janitor of his workplace. He goes into his office and sets a bomb, honey. This escalated very quickly. Meanwhile, back on the honeymoon, the couple smash, and it's what we'd expect from the series at this point. Whatever quality you think it would be, it's still that, you know, flavored like manila folders and Mondays. Christian's people call in and let him know that someone exploded his office. And they have evidence to suggest that the culprit is actually Anna's creepy boss, or that he may have something to do with it. Furthermore, we find out that he may also have had something to do with that random helicopter crash. You know, the one that almost killed Christian in the last movie? Apparently, he may have had something to do with that. Christian assures that everything is under control and once they come back, he introduces Anna to her new security team, which as jealous of a person as Christian is, I found it very interesting that he got like the hottest guy possible to be her security guard, but okay. But immediately Anna's kind of uncomfortable with her new life. She feels a little out of place being waited on hand and foot. Self-sufficient, she likes to do things for herself. She's not used to, again, being waited on head and foot. She basically lets the people know like, hey, just like you guys, I'm just very rich. I'm just very, very rich. She tells the staff to take some time off so that she can cook for Christian, you know, like a real married couple, not one that's like billionaires or whatever. And while they're eating the dinner that she prepared, they end up having this conversation that they definitely should have had before now, which is, do you want to have kids? The sheer fact that they like got, first of all, this entire series apparently happened within a course of a few months. So they met, she got her job, she got promoted at said job. He almost died in a plane crash. She almost got attacked by the old boss. She fought his abuser. A lot of stuff done happened. It's been a lot of drama. There ain't no way I've known this man for two months or however, like less than a year doing all this. And we got married. And I guess because all of that happened, they didn't have time to talk about kids, I guess preoccupied, you know, all the baby making you were doing, you didn't think to talk about, okay, whatever. But uh, Christian's a little standoffish about the topic and admits that he doesn't really wanna have kids, presumably anytime soon, also probably ever, because he doesn't want her time to be preoccupied with a kid right now because he wants her all to himself, which I definitely get. Kids are a lot, especially if you just got married, just enjoy, you know. But it feels like he's really trying to say he doesn't want any kids, which again is a conversation y'all should have had before y'all got married. But any hoodle. Speaking of Anna and things going very quickly for her, she gets promoted again. She's been there for like, how long has this series been going on? She's been there for like, what, three to four months, if that. 
Wasn't she still in college like two months ago? And she's gotten promoted twice now. <laughs> she's getting promoted for the second time while she wasn't even in the building. And while the pretty black receptionist has been there before she got there. Hey, art and life they say. But there's another woman who seems to share a little resentment that I can understand why. Her name is Liz. And she pops in, gives us a little jealous coworker vibes. And she of course will be a factor later. Now, while at her job that she's grossly unsuited for, she's interviewing this guy for a publishing spot, presumably. And in walks Christian Grey. Damn you man, musseth you fucketh with a mine bag. He comes in to interrupt her at her job Presumably because the author is an attractive man. This perhaps is the thing that frustrates me the most. N not the most, but it's one of the things that no I notice a lot. Again, Capricorn gang gang. Um, in fairness, Christian Grey has been on a level of abusive this entire storyline, to be honest with you. But he's also financially abusive as well. I don't know if they ever figure out or ever like solidify whether or not he no, they do because they refer to him as her boss's boss's boss. So now he's in cahoots with where she works. She's getting, you know, side-eyed by people because people think she got her job because of her, you know, her new husband, which of course she is. She's been there for four days and had two promotions and you think it has nothing to do. I don't know if we as the audience are supposed to think, you know, she's just greatly qualified for this job or this is in some way indicative of her relationship with Christian Grey, but I, I'm not gonna think about it too hard because it's obvious that the movie he doesn't want me to. But he comes in there to swing his junk around and basically say to her, hey, why aren't you called Anastasia Gray on all of your emails? I still got beach sand in my ass crack from the honeymoon and you're coming in here complaining because I haven't changed my name yet. Everybody on my email list already knows me as Anastasia Steele. Everybody already looking at me sideways because they think I got my job because we're married now and, and before that I was screwing you. So now you come in here in the middle of work to bitch about how I haven't changed my last name yet. Like I wouldn't change nothing. My last name would stay what it is because y'all already know me in a career wise setting as Anastasia Steele. Why the hell would I change that? And two, I'll have to beat his ass. Do you know how freaking unprofessional this is? You're messing with my bag. Anna, making a good point, is like, dude, I still need like my own identity, dude. Just because I'm your wife does not mean that I'm just like your shadow now, dude. And though again, she's, talking in that voice, that like chain smoking kindergartner voice. I still resonate with you. You go girl, strong woman. But alas, as she's done this entire movie, in an effort to appease him, she's like, sure, I'll change my name to Anastasia Gray. After work, awful music plays as they race into the woods. And they're racing like into the woods um, to find this like historical home out in the middle of complete seclusion, something of like Scottish folklore or something like that, you know, romantic. Beautiful home, by the way. And it's already theirs because Christian, of course, doesn't consult Anna for anything and has purchased it already. Whatever, you're a billionaire. It's not like we're gonna be destitute, so. The realtor is a pretty blonde woman that apparently already knows Christian or is very familiar with him and has a lot of nerve. Like right in front of the wife, just like, you're not there. Okay, so side note, I made a mistake and got glitter on my face. So now let's purposely put glitter on my face. <laughs> yeah, how disrespectful, just all in front of a married man, just like feeling on his lapel, like, <laughs> you're so funny. How hard up must thine be? Anna, who is not here to play with these hoes is like, back up. Anna drives the car back to the city and come to find out that someone is tailing them. And I don't know, what it is about this scene that is particularly awful acting wise, but like I've always referred to Christian as kind of this uncanny valley pseudo human. I don't know, I just feel like something about this scene is like, you're not concerned enough. I mean, you're, your wife is driving a car to presumably outrun someone who's trying to harm both of you. It may also be the insufferable music playing while it happens as well, but. It's pretty remarkable, actually. This is what I get for wearing a white shirt during a makeup video. But they end the chase scene, end up having another anticlimactic sex scene. This time in the car. What's it like to be skinny? Because <laughs> ain't no way my tall, thick ass gonna sit. Gonna be sitting in there with you? 
Absolutely not. Have you seen my thighs? Luscious, but spatially demanding. They find that the person that was chasing them is actually a woman and presumably someone who's working with creepy boss from last movie. And the thing about it is because it's a woman, I mean, granted, we don't know who it is anyway, but especially because it's a woman, it could be anybody. Because again, it could be the stalker from the last movie. It could be his assaulter. It could be any of the various women he's had like a dominant submissive relationship with. They tend to attach. <laughs> but they decide that this woman must be working with the creepy boss from the last movie. His name is Hyde, by the way. More sexually charged activities, this time while she's cutting his hair or trimming his beard or something cute or whatever. Seems ill time considering all that's going on, but hey, there are always something going on, so you'll never have sex. <laughs> but while looking for scissors to cut his hair, she ends up finding the stalker from the last movie's gun in Christian's desk. She goes up to Christian. She's like, hey, what's with the gun? And he tells her the backstory of it, that he just kind of kept it, which... That's not how evidence works. Why would he still, <laughs> I just thought about that. Wouldn't the police have taken that when they took it? Anyway, but he says he'll get rid of it. So Christian ends up going off to New York for a meeting or something. And though he wants Anna to go along with him, she's like, I have work to do. I'll be fine. That's why you got me security. It'll be cool. And though she's been instructed, I'm a grown ass woman, but instructed to go straight home after work, she gets a text from that girl that was her old roommate before she met Christian who's currently dating Christian's brother. She ends up disobeying Christian by going to see her friend instead of going straight home because that was his instruction for her. And the old roommate is like, yeah, ever since Hyde showed back up the creepy boss from before, Christian has security on all of her friends and family members and it's very annoying. And Anna, of course, was none the wiser to this. And then, like I said, she's dating Christian's brother and she's basically like, I think he's cheating on me. They use a lot more flowery words than that, but that's the gist of it. And Anna doesn't wanna believe that Christian's brother would do that, but who knows? Back at the apartment, Hyde has actually already broken into their home. And when Anna arrives, he threatens to kidnap her at knife point. Luckily, security is there to subdue him before he can do any damage and to take him away for trespassing and they were all still witnesses. So yay, win-win, Hyde is out of the way. Never to bother the happy couple again. Of course he's there to bother a happy couple again anyway. When the detectives come to talk about Hyde, basically they show this piece of paper that they found or that he had or whatever that said, you owe me a life referring to Christian and Anna has no idea what this paper has to do with anything. Christian back home and distraught that she was almost killed and also that she had disobeyed his orders for once doesn't want to fuck away the pain. He must be pissed. <laughs> the news gets when that Hyde had tried to kidnap Anna and Liz, the jealous woman from the office having read about this story basically comes in out of concern to grill her about like, what happened? What did he do? What happened? Again, this movie isn't very great at subtle foreshadowing. It's very obvious that this woman is up to something nefarious. You know? After work, Christian, still mad at Anna, takes her to the playroom, gives her a little buzz, buzz, zap, zap, if you get my drift. And for some reason, <laughs> and for some reason that is alarming to her. And you know what's funny about that? Is that this was the first scene of any of these, first and only scene of any of these movies that was, I could kind of get the hotness from it. I was like, okay, let's go to, okay. And she has a breakdown right after. I'm like, what's wrong with me, then? She's like, that's not love. <laughs> what sick game are you playing at? Because essentially he was punishing her with good sex for disobeying him. And I guess that freaked her out. <laughs> but I guess more importantly, this is more of a scene that's about like consent and everything because basically everything that she wanted, he would do the opposite of. If she was like, keep going, he would stop, you know, which is, I get in the grand scheme of consent. What's wrong with me? <laughs> Is there? Ain't nothing wrong with me. Anyway, they start arguing about that and Christian's like, I had a dream that you were dead. You were lying on the concrete. More music plays, so you know it's time for an adventure. They go up to Aspen with all of Anna's friends for like a friendly getaway. Anna asks Christian if she thinks that his brother would ever cheat on her friend who was also her ex roommate. The ex-roommate is concerned that that realtor from before is sleeping with her boyfriend who is Christian's brother. I really should learn names. That would be easier, but I just don't care. Christian's like, I mean, he's probably had sex with her before. He's had sex with half of the world. I mean, he probably had sex with her before, but that doesn't mean he's having sex with her now. But either way, it's none of our business. Anna also has a nightmare, but this time that Hyde is trying to take Christian's place. She wakes up 
goes to the kitchen. They have some very ill place Ben and Jerry's product placement. Who the hell just eats vanilla Ben and Jerry's? What a waste of a car. What a waste of six dollar ice cream. <laughs> Nothing with a brownie core. I don't like Cherry Garcia, but at least it's a flavor. I'm more of their cookie dough. Someone can bury me in Coffee Toffee Crunch and I'd be thankful. Honestly, someone tried to read me on Twitter. They were like, Kendall, aren't you lactose intolerant? Aren't you supposed to be drinking water and minding your own damn business? I know that my intestines don't like me. I didn't ask for your input. Christian stays back while everybody else goes on a hike, which I find strange considering the entire movie. He's super overly protective. So you would think, I, I mean, I guess he's fine with the bitch getting eaten by a bear or something, but anyway. But along the trail, Anna asked Christian's brother what he was like as a child. Apparently he didn't speak or cry when he was first adopted. And of course this being a giant fetishized of male trauma, him crying will come up again because that's how you show that her pussy has made him human. You know, we need the whole full circle moment, but anyway. But while everyone is out back at the house, Christian gets more info about Hyde. Apparently, both him and Christian were in and out of foster homes in Detroit. As a Detroiter, <laughs> And, I, and perhaps I am a little overly sensitive because I am a Detroiter, particularly a black Detroiter, like an actual Detroiter. I'm not some, someone from like the suburbs that are 50 miles away. It's like, yeah, I live in Detroit. No, like I was in Detroit. I just notice that whenever Detroit is brought up, and especially in a white man's story, it's always meant to legitimize how dark their past was and how hard life was for them because they lived in Detroit. It's like, fuck you. <laughs> As a Detroit Negress, it upsets me and I'll just leave it at that. Anna spots the brother with that realtor and she starts to look at him sideways like, mm, he might be cheating, but she doesn't say anything to her friend. But yeah, the realtor is very touchy. And this is coming from someone who's very physical touch as like a show of affection. I hug people, I squish their faces, I hold their hands, I cuddle, that's me, that's who I am. She too fucking touchy. She's longingly looking into dude's eyes, chill. Dick is in abundance. We don't have to do this. Anna buys a cute new dress. Very cute. Scooping net line, dramatic low back. Love it. But for some reason, she comes out with her hair down and them damn Kagome cut bangs. Feels very like we have half of the recipe. You know, like we put in the onion powder and, and garlic powder, but none of the salt or pepper. Like we got half of the basics there. The brother proposes to Anna's friend because apparently he was going out with the realtor to get her advice on a ring. All these women abound. He has a sister. <laughs> He has a sister-in-law. He could have picked any of these people to help him get a ring, but he picks, okay. They get back from the friends trip and the detective of the Hyde case comes to talk to Anna. He basically tells her that Hyde is saying that they had slept together and that she's just a dejected lover. And that's why she's trying to pin a kidnapping attempt on him. So that if he gives that story, he's up for bail. Okay. But the detective lets her know that he has a bail hearing and apparently Anna thought it was a great idea to to go to that. <laughs> and like a really crappy disguise too. She wears like sunglasses. It's like we, at said hearing, uh, he has a horrible lawyer. <laughs> he like, well, my dude did break in, but he just wanted to talk. <laughs> and the judge who is equally awful is like, this is not what innocent people do, but Here's a bail for $500,000. Like what? And then the lawyer goes back and he's like, your honor. And it's like, we've already failed. I'm surprised that he even gave us bail after your defense was, yeah, he kind of did it, but he just wanted to chat. Yeah, he climbed through a window to have a nice conversation. I'm surprised we're getting bail at all. Shut up. Of course, on the way out, Hyde notices the clown fuckery of her there in sunglasses trying to act like she's not at his bail hearing. Perhaps nervous because of the situation, Anna ends up vomiting in the bathroom. She's also pregnant, if you didn't see that coming. Apparently, with all of the madness of the last few months, she's completely forgotten to go to the doctor to get her uh, contraceptive shot. And she is now carrying Christian Gray's child. She, of course, tells Christian that she's pregnant and he has his very convincing performance of a panicked breakdown about how he isn't ready to be a father. Upset, he leaves the home, comes back very, very drunk, basically whines about how a new baby means no more sex and the kid is gonna take all her attention away and then he passes out. While he's passed out, Anna realizes that he got a text from his friend and racist from the last movie saying something along the lines of like, good to see you tonight. I'm here for you if you need anything, that whole thing. And Anna 
It's like, okay, I get pregnant and you go cheat on me with that old bag of bones booty ass bitch who was also your abuser. Why I carrieth your giant head child. Upset, she goes to his office and gets the keys to the red room and decides to sleep on one of the very stylish couches in there for the night. Christian awakes to realize that Anna isn't there. He has a whole moment. He goes to all of the like security people and all of his helpers like, find my wife, you know, yada, 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 only for her to arise from the red room. And he's upset with her, like, where were you? Blah, 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 blah. They argue because Anna's like, even if you did not have sex with Mrs. Robinson, the Crypt Creeper, you cheated on me when you left and had her console you over our child. And then you came back and complained about how the child will take me away from you, which it very well will if you have to make me choose between this child or you. I will do it. I will take your big head baby and I will choose that child over you every time. Keep in mind, I'm making this argument way more animated than it actually was because Christian gives this his performance. <laughs> as he's been doing this entire series. Now, because this movie is dragging, much like all the other movies, they finally get to some action at some point around here. Like, Mia, Christian's sister, ends up getting kidnapped by Hyde and one of his helpers, who ends up being that Liz chick. Hyde proves that he has her kidnapped by sending over a photo, which was inappropriately hilarious, by the way, of her tied up. I don't know why it cracked me up, it just did. I'm sorry, we don't have time, let's move on. Now. We finally get the like evil origin story monologue about what Hyde is so mad about because apparently Christian has the life that he was always supposed to live or something. I guess because they were from the same area, if he would have got adopted by the rich, well-to-do family, then he would be who Christian is today, I guess. I don't know. But he's like, give me $5 million in two hours. Like, don't tell Christian because then this chick is swimming with the fishes. Anna goes back home, gets that gun from the office that apparently Christian hadn't gotten around to throwing away yet, I guess. And if you recall, she's instructed to stay home by Christian. So she has to basically trick the security guard that's with her so that he doesn't come after her to go get Mia, I guess, and doesn't stop her from leaving. By the way, when he realized that she was gone, that was the most convincing like concern anyone has had for her this entire series. That's crazy. He definitely should have been Christian. Anna goes to the bank, asks for $5 million, and obviously that's a lot of money and they're not gonna allow her to take out that much money without the consent of Christian. So they call Christian, put her on the phone. For some reason, Christian thinks that she's taking this money out so that she can leave him. And for some reason, she allows that to be the looming thought instead of just saying, no, I'm not leaving you, but it's an emergency. But instead she just like, Christian. So that there's this misunderstanding. That's really bad writing, but drama, sure, whatever. But somehow through like his deep connection and intuition or whatever, he can tell that Anna's lying and that she's in trouble, even though she could have just said, hey, we're in trouble. Like give her the money. So she takes the money, she goes on the ride to go get Mia. Christian is informed that his sister is missing as well. And he's like, oh, that must be what this is all about. So now it's a race against time before they turn her into mincemeat. Anna does some like little trickery so that when they tell her to throw away her phone so that it can't be tracked, she throws away somebody else's so she has her phone as well. I don't know why they didn't think to frisk her. Y'all are some terrible criminals. Like you just assume she threw away all of the tracking devices she had. Anywho, following her uh, GPS system of her phone in an incredibly anticlimactic scene. Aren't all the scenes from the series, honestly, but Anna gets there, there's a tussle. He kicks her in the stomach and being that she's pregnant, that's not great. The scene abruptly ends when she shoots him in the leg. And I don't know, the acting is so bad. Instead of, <laughs> instead of it looking like, oh my God, my baby. Oh my God, the drama. Oh my God, the pain. It just looks like she has cramps. Like that was me yesterday. Yesterday, dead ass, just like. Ugh. She then passes out. Who knows why? I find it quite interesting that most romances, in particular, use like women passing out as like a as like a scene transition. <laughs> It's so lazy anyway. But Mia and Anna are saved. Hyde and Liz are arrested. Anna goes to the hospital. They check on the baby, the baby's fine. And after realizing that he nearly lost Anna and his unborn child, Christian realizes that he does actually wanna have a baby with her. And he does wanna spend that particular form of life with her. He sheds a tear. Again, we're supposed to use this as his like catalyst of becoming human. They find out that the Liz lady was helping Hyde because he was blackmailing her with a sex tape, which don't make no sense to me because the world can see me busted open before I catch a charge. Absolutely not. Y'all just gonna have to see my pussy from here to the end of time. Rest your weary heart and relax your mind. I'm gonna love you again to the end of time. 
sorry. I've been shooting up Flonase for the last few days. I'm a little delirious. Anyway, there's no way in hell that I'm catching a kidnapping charge just for people to see my OnlyFans drafts. Absolutely not. Christian and Anna go and find the grave of Christian's birth mom. They leave flowers, I guess, to show that he finally forgave her and for his rough upbringing or something, I don't know. And fast forward, they pop out a big head baby. They live on this like Scottish fairy tale land and they live happily ever after. And we don't address any of the other problematic dynamics of this relationship. Finn. So that's it, my friends. That is all of the Fifty Shades of Grey trilogy. I'm still flabbergasted that they ever were made into any form of high grossing content. But alas, people like what they like and people don't like what they don't like and I don't like this. But you know, as bad as these movies are, they do lend to great content and, and because of that, I can't completely hate them. There is a soft spot in my heart for my videos in relation to Fifty Shades of Grey. And for that, I gotta give it its flowers because we wouldn't be here today if it weren't for that. And that, my friends, is all for today, folks. If you like this video, feel free to like this video. Follow me on all my social media, Instagram, Twitter, both of which are KennyJD. If you have other bad movies that you'd like me to check out, feel free to put those down in my comment section, and I will see you guys next time.